On today's World Insight, a virtual World Economic Forum 2022 kicks off as Chinese President Xi Jinping delivers a key policy speech touching on globalization, peaceful coexistence, green growth, and taking on a resurgent pandemic. And how does China and a diversity of views figure the World Economic Forum? Why every stakeholder's voice matters. In the words of the WEF representative in Beijing, Rebecca Ivey. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. This year's World Economic Forum Agenda 2022 opens online Monday for a five day event. Heads of state, business leaders, and other participants take stock of global risks with the theme State of the World. Their diverse inputs will help craft the solutions to the world's most pressing challenges. For his part, Chinese President Xi Jinping has delivered a policy speech at the forum, saying all nations are all in the same boat, a giant ship trying to navigate dangerous waters. He adds economic globalization is the trend of our time, a river sure to flow to the sea no matter the countercurrents. And he emphasized the true multilateralism is the best way forward for everyone's benefit. Countries around the world should uphold true multilateralism. We should remove barriers, not erect walls. We should open up, not close off. We should seek integration, not decoupling. This is the way to build an open world economy. Besides economic growth, the Chinese leader also touched on environmental issues, stressing the importance of ecological conservation along with economic growth. He said that China will actively engage in international cooperation on climate and jointly work for a complete transition to a greener economy and society. Listen to this. China will stay committed to promoting ecological conservation. As I have said many times, we should never grow the economy at the cost of resource depletion and environmental degradation, which is like draining a pond to get fish. Nor should we sacrifice growth to protect the environment, which is like climbing a tree to catch fish. Guided by our philosophy that clean waters and green mountains are just as valuable as gold and silver, China has carried out holistic conservation and systematic governance of its mountains, rivers, forests, farmlands, lakes, grasslands and deserts. We do everything we can to conserve the ecological system, intensify pollution prevention and control, and improve the living and working environment for our people. On that earlier, I talked to Rebecca Ivey, the Beijing representative officer of the World Economic Forum. She did echo the major points given by Chinese President. President Xi has become even more vocal about the importance of opening up and of cooperation across countries. What has perhaps evolved in President Xi's remarks is emphasizing even more the importance of environmental sustainability and climate action. The World Economic Forum 2022, Agenda 2022, in fact it is called, provides a platform for global leaders and stakeholders to jointly work on solutions for the biggest global risks as advocated by Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. At this pivotal moment, I see several priorities for the global agenda. We must continue to fight against the global pandemic. We must revitalize the global economy and accelerate its transition to net zero. We must preserve biodiversity by deploying nature-based solutions and we must narrow the gap between the rich and the poor to achieve more sustainable global development. On the global agenda that has been heavily discussed at the ongoing Agenda 2022 at the World Economic Forum, let's loop in tonight's panelists. In London, Ian Begg, a professorial research fellow from the European Institute 
of the London School of Economics and Political Science. Also, we have in Beijing, Liu Baocheng, the dean from the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and Economics. We hope later there will be more panelists join us when they are ready online. Professor Bag, go to you first. Of course, World Economic Forum before the pandemic, every year annual meeting. This time it's different. It's called Agenda 2022, and yet. It is setting some of the most important global challenges right in, the, in front of everybody's eyes, including the global leaders. So what do you think, a, a rallying moment or reflection moment? Yeah, that's two R's to start with, rallying and reflection. And I think there's also a third one, which would be rebooting, because there is a, a need to rethink much of the global socio-economic system that has been shown to be let's, let's say under challenge as a result of the pandemic mm. and I think there'll be many people in in virtual Davos who will be thinking about how do we do things differently in future compared with what we've done in the past. Mm. To give one example of this uh, there are certain industries such as uh, international travel which have suffered very badly during the pandemic but they've also been to some extent replaced by engaging in virtual communication. So the acceleration of some of these new communications technologies is something that will come into the story. But I think that there is much in President Xi's speech which is at the core of the agenda that's being discussed for uh, n not just Agenda 2022 as mm -hmm. interpreted by Davos, but also the way the rest of us see the world evolving. Mm. Also, we are joined on the phone, Professor Bert Hoffman, who is the director of the East Asian Institute at the National University of Singapore. Uh, Bert, good to hear your voice. Uh, tell me, what is your take as the world is struggling with domestic priorities and also global agenda? Well, so uh, President Xi clearly emphasized this global agenda, and I think that is very for. Uh, the meeting in Davos, where many uh, global leaders come together. So the f support for uh, multilateralism, support for globalization, is, I think, the most important point in the speech. It's also important for the Davos discussion, because it, it clearly globalization is under pressure. It was already before COVID-19, but more so now. Right. A lot of people are talking about uh, 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 reducing uh, uh, globalization to become less vulnerable, I don't think that's the solution. It's good to hear from President Xi that he believes that is indeed, uh, it is not the solution either. Mm. I guess our producer needs to have a better connection with uh, Professor Hoffman a bit later. Let me talk to you a bit later. Uh, Professor Liu Baocheng with me also on the phone from Beijing. Professor Liu, uh, there seems to be absence of some uh, important uh, figures. Uh, uh, for example, from certain countries at this year's Agenda 2022. However, uh, many of the global challenges are actually shared by everybody. So, uh, Professor Liu, uh, what do you think uh, the China's role could be? Well, I think China sets a good example, although the world are really treating the coronavirus in a different way, which is uh, understandable. But China does set a good example as how they manage the coronavirus uh, so that uh, people can really keep a normal life and uh, uh, keep a uh, increasing return uh, mm -hmm. to productivity by uh, Chinese labor force. And that is also why China is able to export more to uh, uh, satisfy the critical need of uh, many other countries uh, who are really suffering from uh, this pandemic. And uh, uh, secondly, I think the, uh, China maintained its strong put in the uh, global supply chain by continuing operating its uh, manufacturing hub so that, yeah. uh, you know, from daily utilities uh, to, uh, to industrial use, and China is ready to supply. And third is the China's e-commerce. Uh, China's e-commerce does not, does not only help the Chinese people to uh, keep a uh, routine and uh, normalized life, but also is helping the world because uh, e-commerce is really spreading across the world in the line with the digital economy that is uh, uh, being more and more globalized. Okay, uh, now, uh, Mr. Berg, uh, let me also go into some details about this. Uh, agenda is one thing, 
real actions are the other thing. So uh, have we seen some real progress uh, since some of the global uh, challenges have already been clearly identified over the past few years? Well, yes and no. I think the, the big danger with a speech such as President Xi's is it all sounds very optimistic. There are, there are good things in it, which everybody can agree to. But where it gets difficult is where there are hard choices to be made. Now, let me take two examples of, of this. One, one is vaccine rollout to those parts of the world which have not yet received sufficient vaccines. We talk about this as saying nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Mm -hmm. But the same applies to something like climate change, where I'm sure you're aware that the, many of the participants in COP26 in, in Glasgow last November were quite critical of India in particular, but also in China in not wanting to do things as quickly as the rest of the world wanted. And there again, climate change is yet another example of nobody is safe until everybody is safe because of the, the risks of things going badly wrong. So I think we have to look beneath the, the warm rhetoric and consider whether there is substance to some of the proposals that are being made, not just by President Xi, but by other participants in mm. Davos, and be really critical of whether we believe them. Mm. Professor Liu, then I have to let you respond about the speed, the commitment, the differences developing, developed economies, and also the pace of commitment and fulfilling the commitment. Yeah, I think the uh, a positive sign is that uh, finally with the uh, more of the strong uh, proposal from the developed world, the uh, uh, technology for manufacture uh, of the vaccines are uh, kept open. So that I think that's a good achievement, but that's not enough because, uh, you know, some of these countries do not even have the pharmaceutical capacity. So that uh, that's something that uh, continue. They need uh, the support from the developing world. And uh, uh, the other is that, uh, you know, the debt issue. Uh, because of the high rise of the inflation, uh, the debt issue uh, in those uh, developing countries are getting more and more serious. And whether those uh, uh, the developed world are able to uh, uh, to introduce a sort of a haircut over the debt so that's also a, uh, uh, a great question that needs to be answered. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, for climate change, you know, people right now, uh, you know, come to, uh, uh, come to the uh, immediate challenge of uh, dealing with COVID, but uh, that does not really front the also imperative issue of uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. So much of the talk is there, and we see business are moving but uh, uh, the uh, more of the consensus and the coordinated efforts are still required. Mm. Uh, Professor Hoffman, can you also hear me? If you can, uh, we can reflect upon five years ago when Chinese President Xi Jinping was making a groundbreaking speech at the World Economic Forum in which he talked about the China's understanding of globalization and the roles and responsibilities and now, five years later, he made another speech. Of course, uh, th the world has been changing so much. So how would you compare the time then and now and the priorities that countries are struggling with? Well, that speech was given uh, on, the, on the day or before that uh, President Trump was inaugurated in the United States. And of course, right. that changed a lot of the international atmosphere. I think it's very a hopeful sign that, that President Xi is still emphasizing multilateralism and, and uh, open trade and globalization. At the same time, uh, there is a clear uh, change in, in, in attitude, also in China, where the emphasis on national security is bigger, where the dual circulation strategy is, is basically uh, an expression of concerns on national security just like there is in the United States, just like there is in other parts of the world. So, so I think that is the new element in this. And, of course, the COVID-19 uh, mm. pandemic has put a lot of the domestic issues in countries to the fore. So uh, China has done relatively well managing the, the COVID-19. Other countries have less so. And I think a lot of countries uh, are in a stage where they're trying to first resolve their domestic issues rather than some of the international issues. Mm. That's not right as such, but it's a reality. Mm. 
We have to wrap it up here. Our time is running out for this round of discussion. Uh, certainly discussions are important, but even more important are the real actions uh, on different agenda issues. Thank you once again, the three of you. Bert Hoffman, Liu Baocheng, Yin Baek. Appreciate it. And this is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Coming up in the program, how does China and the diversity of views figure in the World Economic Forum? Why every stakeholder's voice matters? In the words of the World Economic Forum representative in Beijing, Rebecca Abi, next. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Chinese President Xi Jinping's opening day speech at the World Economic Forum, Agenda 2022, offers a practical way forward for the international community, many believe. As he said, a world divided with 190 nations rolling their own small boats in every direction will have a tough time steering through global crises. A world working together underscores humanity's shared future and common prosperity. Over the years, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, we've listened to Chinese leaders and diverse voices who push for better, more equitable global governance and sustainable growth. Rebecca Ivey, the World Economic Forum Beijing representative officer, is a young, dynamic, and passionate team leader who does not shy away from her mission to promote crucial change for a global reboot. Let's hear her words. Tell me more about your global risk report. I know there are several areas that the World Economic Forum, together with members, uh, categorize as the most important priorities for the world. Tell me, how does that going to have an impact on your agenda in China? The 2022 Global Risks Report highlighted risks across three time horizons, short term, between now and the next two years, medium term, between two and five years, and long-term risks, which are really five to 10 years in the future. And across all three time horizons, we really saw that climate action failure, mm. as well as extreme weather events featured in the top three, both in the short term, the medium term, and the long term. So what that really means for leaders today is that immediate action is of course needed, but also a longer term strategy is required. Mm. What kind of long-term strategy is the World Economic Forum thinking about with its members? So in the long term, we're looking not only at climate action in the sense of reducing carbon emissions, but also biodiversity protection and enhancement as a way of ensuring that we're going to build a more holistically sustainable environment and not just one that is doing less harm from a human or industrial perspective. And many really wonder how much common ground of energy and efforts will countries really put into to solve some of the problems you just mentioned. Well, as I mentioned before, among the short-term risks, of course, environmental-related risks like climate action failure are very heavily reflected, but so are societal risks such as social cohesion mm -hmm. and also uh, livelihood impacts as well as debt crises due to uh, facing the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think what is clear in the World Economic Forum's approach to addressing risks is that environmental challenges and economic challenges have to be addressed simultaneously with social issues. So how is the World Economic Forum going to help to further establish and stabilize and probably even more bring more innovation to that platform between China and the rest of the world? Well, if I take, for example, our climate action platform, we have over 150 of the world's leading companies committed to taking action on climate change. And we also have over 50 NGOs and international institutions that are working together on this platform. Mm -hmm. We very much want to leverage the uh, cases that are being successful in different countries, in different industries, and really uh, combine them with what is working well in China. Mm -hmm. So what works uh, best from our perspective is a combination of thought leadership, community, and then an impact focus. So really having metrics that we can hold ourselves accountable to, mm -hmm. to see if we are making progress. So in what areas are we talking about here? So uh, if we look at the global risks report as a compass mm. for the areas in which we should focus, of course, climate action is a key priority.
but so too is biodiversity protection. So one uh, report which will be released today is actually looking at the new nature economy. Specifically from a China perspective, what is the contribution of nature and biodiversity to China's economy? And that's not only in terms of raw materials or in terms of GDP, but really looking at people's livelihoods. Mm -hmm. So this is a great example where we've taken an issue such as environmental protection, but really looked at it from different lenses, be they uh, economic policy or be they really uh, what companies can do to reskill their workforces to promote biodiversity and nature-based jobs in their supply chains. Now, one could argue is the most complicated time among all uh, the years that World Economic Forum has been in China. So how do you see, Rebecca, your agenda? We are talking about the Agenda 2022. My background is really in the humanities. Mm. So what has driven my uh, career in the World Economic Forum over the past 12 years has actually been the desire to really incorporate different perspectives, different values, mm. and also a learning from history to look to the future. And that has been part of my, my story here in the forum. I can think back actually to the last annual meeting we held in 2020 in Davos. And one of the uh, discussions there that I found most fascinating was a conversation between Yuval Harari, mm. who is a very noted uh, technology historian and philosopher. He's really looking at the ethics and values of technology in the future. And rather than having him speaking in an academic panel, we brought him together with Ren Zhengfei from Huawei to really have a discussion uh, without borders of industry or government or politics mm -hmm. to really explore what does technology mean for our societies. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of uh, background that has driven me at the World Economic Forum to really bring different voices together. Mm -hmm. And I believe that in China this is needed now more than ever. China uh, has such a diversity of stakeholders. We work with, for example, even if we just look at business, we work with Chinese companies of all different sizes, from medium-sized enterprises to technology startups to the second largest company in the world, a state-owned enterprise in electricity. So it's really a quite a diverse uh, set of voices, even if you just look within business. Mm -hmm. And all of those voices need to be heard as we search for global solutions. And at the same time, we very much want to be a bridge for the voices from other countries around the world, from diverse stakeholder groups, mm -hmm. to really come up with a common solution to a common challenge. From your work, how to make sure it is not just one version of the story, but rather different versions are being considered, are being heard, and also are being communicated. Uh, how do you see that possibility? Well, what you just shared really reminds me of one of my favorite essays by an author called uh, Chimamande Ngozi Aditye. Mm -hmm. She wrote an essay called The Danger. An African writer. Yes, she's from Nigeria. And she wrote a story uh, about the danger of a single story, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you are describing. She discusses how stereotypes can persist as a black or white version of another people or another culture. I think this is very dangerous when we have only one perspective of a, a country or a culture which may represent different values than our own if we only hear one story about that country or even only one story from that country, we miss the real richness of what makes us connected and what actually unites us uh, in our humanity. So we very much embrace that uh, concept of diversity in our multi-stakeholder approach. Of course, thought leadership alone is not enough. Mm -hmm. We need communities to be built around those agendas mm -hmm. to really commit to each other and to their uh, communities to take action and then we need to measure the impact. Globally speaking, there are so many multilateral platforms. Of course, World Economic Forum was born at a very unique time and has been maintaining its beliefs since then. In China, for example, if you work with China, China also have many outreaches to the rest of the world. After all, it is the second largest economy in the world. So what is gonna be the relevancy of the World Economic Forum Earlier, there were some discussions, I understand, at the World Economic Forum about this. What about now? Well, the World Economic Forum has over a 50-year history. We have been bringing together governments, business, civil society, academics, as well as quite challenging and controversial voices from society to really challenge the status quo. 
I do see this as the biggest opportunity and challenge for the World Economic Forum globally to be associated with moving beyond the status quo rather than reinforcing the status quo. Mm -hmm. So this is where tapping into not only our core communities of business and government leaders, but really looking at media voices such as yourself, uh, at civil society and at young global leaders to really look beyond the present day and to question and to really challenge ourselves what could be possible. This, I think, is a true value of the World Economic Forum, even compared to some of the other multilateral platforms you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really a unique differentiating factor for the World Economic Forum. However, here in China during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it is, of course, harder than it was before to meet in person, especially across borders. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult sometimes to keep our heads up and look at the horizon when the uncertainty is so great. Uh, in the short term. So I do believe that the World Economic Forum is invested in the long term. We are working hard to bring uh, teams and platforms together, looking at those long-term risks that were highlighted in the Global Risk Report. We plan to build out these competencies in China and really to again ensure that for the long term, Chinese voices, Chinese stakeholders are part of the global conversation mm -hmm. and vice versa, that they also have access to really the latest uh, discussions and latest insights that are coming from different regions around the world. Keep our heads up and look at the horizon. That is also very important today. That was a conversation I had with the World Economic Forum representative in Beijing, Rebecca Ivy. Tune in tomorrow of World Insights for more insights from the World Economic Forum president himself, Borge Brandet. Don't miss it. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.